Greetings. All right. The chat is live. I am live. And I'm just coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. This is Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. Tonight's our Anyone Can Farm live chat. Thursday night edition. Okay, not Friday night yet. Almost uh, almost goof that one. Well, I just got off the line with the resistance babes, a.k.a. resistance chicks. And uh, just had a nice conversation about farming and uh, resisting and things like that. It's nice. I always like to spend a little time with those gals. And uh, the, I hear something beeping. Well, it's only beeped twice, though. Okay. It's the power cord. It's the power cord. Plug it if it starts. Okay. It like we don't have anybody in yet. Oh, now we have one person in. Right on. Okay. Okay. So it's Thursday. What do we got for a date here? Um, all right, Nancy's with us. Haven's with us. Haven, by the way, we have a we have a date for the uh, tribe day. And it's the 9th of July, and I guess that's going to be forever. We're going to be taking up that day. That's going to be our day for the tribe. <clears throat> Sean Wise, right on, man. So maybe Haven, the, the planning, the steering committee will probably hit you up for, uh, for your services again because did such a good job last year. That'd be all right. Bryce is with us. How you doing, Bryce? I was over in your neck of the woods today. Went over to Ebel's to pick some stuff up. It's one of my end of day things that I always do. And the Declare Homesteads with us too. Right on. So everything's going good here, I guess. Um, I put in a another nearly full day uh, working on my. My wood shop actually uh, didn't get everything done I wanted to, but did get it cleaned up and finally freed up the door so I can close it up. And uh, felt like I I got enough done, I guess. Um, I've been kind of struggling with this tooth. I got to go in Monday, and they're going to extract it. And uh, the Tylenol that they gave me is co-tylenol so it's got codeine in it i didn't realize but it was really kind of messing with my head a little bit so i don't think i'm going to take it anymore i went and got some regular tylenol and it seems with extra strength though it seems like it takes care of it the time when it bothers me the most is right after lunch and what happened was a filling that i had from back in high school uh, the tooth got weakened right there and it broke off right into the gum. So there's a big section of it that's exposed and it must be a nerve right there. doesn't look like much, but it sure does, sure does hurt. And right now it's not bothering me at all. I wouldn't even know it's there. But when it does hurt, like if I've been out in the cold and then I come into the, uh, inside, wow, it hurts. All right, I got some stuff to pass on. Um, some pretty important stuff, too. Um, you guys, let's see. We got, we got eight people in. I need some help with something big time. But it's, I, I don't know if I, it falls into the category of help. I think that we all have a duty to do whatever we can. Uh there's problems in our country right now, I think. Uh, they appear to be uh, from where I'm sitting. And it's not permanent. It's 
it's ebbs and flows, you know, and uh, right now we have some pretty crummy leadership, I think, and we can do something about that. We need different leadership. And it's, it's not just the president being a crummy leader. We have crummy leaders at the county level. We have crummy leaders at the state level. Our governor is an absolute disaster. You don't hear much from that pie hole these days. Taylor and Sailor are and Sarah are here. Well, good. Um, I met a guy several years ago now at the uh, Rogue Food Conference. Actually, that's where I met um, Sean and Amy. Was at the Rogue Food Conference. I met another guy there um, and just met him briefly and. When I got home, he called me and he says, uh, "Can I need come see you? Can I come see you?" And I was like, "Yeah, what you know about what?" And because that can be uh, a dangerous game too. Like, what do you want to see me about? And he's like, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I just just getting out of the military and I want to try and figure out what I'm going to do." And da da da. Oh, okay, that's a different story different story. Sure. Come see me. I'll drop what I'm doing. I says, uh, what, what branch of service were you in? Army. And I said, oh, well, okay. I, I can talk with army people. Sometimes it's a little hard because they don't understand you at, at first, but, uh, no, that's just a little, that inner service rivalry. And, uh, so he comes, we make a date when he's going to come. He says, uh, I'm in Indiana. I'm going to come up and see you. And, uh, and then he says, hey, full disclosure, I, I'm, a, I'm an SF guy, and I was actually a Green Beret. And I said, okay, well, cool, thanks for telling me. And uh, it's not like, you know, I have to put special glasses on or anything, but uh, it's kind of nice to know. Um, and I'll tell you this, when I was active duty, uh, I worked for a unit who in, that I worked alongside what they they call CCT crew, troops, uh, combat controllers. And that's the Air Force's version of Army Rangers, somewhat, sort of, uh, and the Air Force's version of, like, Navy SEALs, sort of, uh, the very similar mission. Uh, and... But these guys are more focused on airfield security. And I would spend long nights uh, with them. I, I was a maintenance guy, but we would we would be at unimproved strips in weird places, and uh, you know, there were our security people that were there. and uh, a lot of times no planes were coming in or going out, but we still had to be there. So uh, we got to sit and watch TV together and listen to each other and talk to each other and stuff. But these guys would tell me, oh, no, you'll probably never meet any combat controllers. Uh, you're more likely to meet Green Beret, but that's highly unlikely, too. You'll probably never meet any. And you know what? my 20 years in the military i never saw one and i never spoke to one there's just not that many of them and they stay beneath the surface right? that's the nature of their existence so charles calls me and he tells me that uh he wants to come talk to me so i mean we had immediate re rapport actually anybody that's in the military you just have a rapport with them right away and it's very good and we had a great day he helped process some chickens sort of like sean and amy did uh then we sat and had lunch and talked and all that stuff had a nice time um but he did express to me at the time that he was a little worried about the direction the country was going and i agreed with him and i said uh something like well we have to be prepared we have to maintain our our systems we have to be ready and 
as far as I know right now, no one's asking me to do anything, nor are they asking you to do anything. So stand by. And so uh, that's kind of where we've been at. We've stayed in touch. Telephone. He came and took a class with us and then another visit another time. And uh, I just have a really good feeling about the guy. You know, he's a real solid individual. Well, he's one of these guys that is what I would call, and I've called you guys this too, trigger pullers. And I don't necessarily mean the trigger on a, a firearm or a, any kind of weapon system. I mean somebody who will devise a plan and then execute the plan, right? And the people that are in this group are trigger pullers. I can see a couple of them right now. I'm looking right at you, Andy Zumwalt. Zumwalt, get in here. I'm looking right at you, right? The guy decides what he's going to do and does it, right? Now, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, the you can make plans, but then never even begin to execute the, the plan. There's lots and lots of people like that that are kind of just like corks on the ocean. They're just going wherever the tide takes them. But then there's the Andy Zumwalts that say, no, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to move down to Greenbow, Alabama, and I'm going to do this and does it. And then I'm going to learn how to butcher pigs. Makes a trek 900 miles to my house, learns, and then goes back and starts raising pigs. And I'm, if I had to bet money, I would bet money that he's going to process those pigs at his house. I would bet money. There's another one, Justin Zulka. Zilka. Big time tr trigger puller. Big time. Resistance babes, right there. Big time trigger pullers. Uh, I met them at the Rogue Food Conference, and they beelined right to me. Can we do an interview? And it was like one of the most fun things I did at the Rogue Food Conference. They're a blast. They're really a lot of fun. I hope they come for the Tribe Day. I, they should come for the uh, charcuterie day. That would be a good one. We could comp you for that class and you could do some interviewing while you're here. That would probably be some pretty good content for the resistance checks. For, I bet it, you should think about that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. So um, Charles calls me or sent me a message today and it's like 6.30 this morning and it's like, I'm running for Congress. <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, uh, that was no intermediary jump. It's like, I'm running for Congress. And uh, I mean, he is, he is. So I'm going to ask my, secretary to include his information in the um i got it right here but i'm not sure how i would transfer it over let's see huh let's see how i would do that anyway We'll get this to you, and I would really just this. This is duty. We have to. Uh, we have to get this guy elected. We have to give him a shot. What he is doing is trying to unseat the uh, candidate that's been there forever. The guy is going to be eighty years old next time, and he's a just kind of a rhino type guy. And he's wanting to pass it off to his kid. And it's not a good situation. So it's it's a guy like Charles that will step up and say, I can do this. And it threatens the heck out of them because they don't know what's going to happen. It's sort of what I did. I ran for sheriff here. And, yeah, I don't have any background in that. But I do have a pretty good background in the Constitution. And my terms of employment with the county would be, yeah, I solemnly swear to protect and defend this document 
and uh, the people who it affects, I think I can do that as the county sheriff. It's not like I have to be the gunslinger. That's the undersheriff's job. Um, but he's the he's the one that I can fire this afternoon if I want to. So we're going to do this my way, or you're out of a job, Junior. So we can we can do that. And I think Charles going to Washington would be a really good idea. He's a, a solid guy, and we need to do this. This is something that we can do as a group. And I'm going to revisit this. Uh, I've been thinking about it all day and how we're going to do this. And uh, I don't quite have it nailed down yet. I, I But I wanted to broach the subject with you all today that we're going to be talking about Charles Buckwalter and his uh, Mr. Buckwalter goes to Washington. Be a really good thing. You don't meet too many Green Berets. Let me just tell you that. You don't meet them. So, all right. Let's see who we got here. We got Justin. We got Lorna. <laughs> huh. Lorna's saying, Mark, we need to hook him up with Stu Schuler, the Marine that was just held accountable. And Lorna says, well, we know how to run campaigns. Yeah, Lorna was my campaign manager when I ran for sheriff. And you know what? Charles already putting in his paperwork, he is actively running in the primary, right? He's already shaken them up just by running. They would like to have their rhino candidate run unopposed. But if he does primary the guy, he will probably be going to Washington. So he's got a, a pretty good chance of that. All right. All right. Lauren is asking if you guys could all hit the thumbs up, please. And, um, we need to get people subscribing and liking and sharing the anyone can farm experience, right? And there's some new stuff over there too from Joe. Lorna is saying we won 37% as 37% as a write-in. And that's, that was way back before we knew about Dominion and uh they're cheating but at the time we felt like they were cheating we just felt like that's what was going on and sure enough they were we knew who the president was before we knew who the county sheriff was and there was only six thousand people in my county that vote of twelve thousand residents and yet they had 17 locations and then they have the dominion machines that do the counting for the church ladies yeah, it was a learning experience uh, at the time. Lorna was saying that we really need to canvas. We need to have people at the the voting locations to look over the shoulders of the people that are run, the election officials. And we thought, we don't want to get off on bad foot with these people thinking that we don't trust them. <laughs> well, we dumb. Because we thought they were the church ladies and we can trust them. No, you can't trust them. It didn't matter anyway because they had the Dominion machines and uh, there was one or two people that were in charge of uh, programming that whole thing. And uh, it was not a fair election, I don't think, by any means. But anyway, 37% wasn't actually too bad, actually, for a write-in candidate. And I talked with Charles today about this type of thing uh there are a lot of gis uh, you know american servicemen retired and others uh, that are running for office and it's because they're faced with the reality that well if i don't who will and look who has gravitated towards uh politics political office 
that's not good. We really need some decent human beings running for office. We really do. If we're going to, you know, preserve this society of men that we live in. So. All right. Resistance chicks. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Charles before we went on. Our hour went by very, very fast, and I didn't feel as though I was going to be able to get it in there. I wanted to talk to you about him um, before I just sprung it on you on your show. Um, but you know what we could do? We could have another meeting. We could have a, do another show. I would love to. I, I'll go on anytime with you guys. And we can talk about Charles on your show because I think it's something that we should do. He's willing to sacrifice himself and we need, we need to help him. <laughs> that's a dirty, that's a dirty job. I, when I was running for sheriff, uh, at first you think, well, this is going to be kind of cool. But then when you start rubbing elbows with those folks and you start placing yourself at commission meetings and uh, some of the things that you have to be involved with, you think, ah, oh, what was I thinking? You know, no more just wearing jeans and, you know, boots and, uh, you know, taking a nap after lunch when I feel like it, and, you know, maybe not showering for a couple of weeks at a time, you know, now I'm going to have to act like an adult. I don't know if I want to do this. <clears throat> and when I didn't get elected, it was almost kind of, oh, well, <laughs> I can go back to my life. Um, it's, it's a, it's a rough job, but I, I've since, thought that I would be, I would run it differently than the sheriffs that we see now. I would, I would definitely have a different style. I would spend very little time at the office. I would spend more time at my constituents' homes. You know, if somebody called me with a problem, I need to talk to the sheriff. But the problem is, is you wind up talking to the, you know, the, the 2% of the people that have the big mouths, you know, but uh, instead of them having to come to me, I would just drive to them and sit at the kitchen table and listen to what they have to say and tell them about me. And, you know, we're all in this together, uh, but uh, how are we going to do this? And then I would want to spend time at the high school being in front of the the generations that are coming and saying, see this document? Do you realize what this document does for you, this constitution here? But we don't have that. We, we have sheriffs that are embroiled in, oh, other things, uh, not always good things. Uh, statutory law you know instead of constitutional law statutory law is is a uh, law by agreement uh it's and it's usually agreements between corporations where as an individual i have constitutional rights and that's what needs to be stressed i believe instead of the statutory law between corporations most of the laws that are out there really don't apply to me as a a man, as a man, as an individual. Um, so don't know if that will be happening, but uh, we'll see. I think that what you have is two groups. You have the formal group and the informal group. We're involved right now in the informal group. As the county sheriff, I might have the freedom of speech, However, <laughs> you have to watch your tongue very closely when you sit in that position, very closely. And I don't know how good I would be at that. If I had a weak moment or somebody wanted to stir things up, 
uh, you know, I'm not sure how work, that well that would work out. But the informal group, you know, somebody could write in the newspaper up there in town, did you hear what he said on his radio show the other night? And people would be like, I don't care what he said on his radio show. But if you're the county sheriff and you at a commission meeting, you know, kicked the chair out from underneath somebody and called, told them what you really thought of them. Yeah, that, would, that could cause a problem. <laughs> so we'll see. But I, I really have to hand it to Charles doing what he's doing. Um, that takes a ton of guts to do. And he has a good life. It's not like he needs a job. He has a good job. He has a good business that he runs. He doesn't really need to do this. And going to Washington is a cesspool, right? Um, anybody out there, we want to help this guy. Uh, anybody that has any ideas how to help him, um, I, am, I am all for it. I am all for hearing it. You can PM me and we can chat. Uh, I would like to get Thomas Massey on board with him and do a fundraiser up in Indiana with, with Thomas Massey. Tom's a good guy. I had dinner with him um, down in Kentucky during the uh, the first Rogue Food Conference. Come to think of it, a lot a lot of good came out of that Rogue Food Conference for old, for old me. Um, I met Thomas Massey. I was a big fan, for starters, with him of his and um, I got to eat dinner with him. Imagine that. He showed me an off grid system that he had put together. He had a generator and a set of batteries. The batteries came out of a Prius. Was it a Prius or maybe a Tesla? Yeah, Tesla. And he could, on his cell phone, he could show me where the batteries were, you know, the rate of where, how charged up they were. And um, he put it together all himself. He's, he's a pretty smart guy. He went to MIT. I think he's got a degree in, in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. I don't know. He's still a pretty smart guy, but he's a he's a goofball too. He's 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 a nice guy. He's a nice guy. I wouldn't mind having him over for dinner. Real nice guy. Um, I'm gonna call his office this week and I'm gonna see if I can. Yeah, it was a Tesla. Okay. Dude is a genius. <laughs> I'm gonna call his office and see if I can get on his calendar and um, see what we can do for old Charles. Because it takes some serious guts to do what Charles is doing. And yeah, his life is never going to be the same. Once you run against these establishment people, they, uh, they take it personally. Right. I can tell you, I remember when I ran for County sheriffs, some of the establishment Republicans, they are insane. They would say, what makes you think you can do this? Who do you think you are? You haven't even been a deputy. And then I would just mess with their heads and say, yes, that's true, but I am a farmer. And they would, uh, okay. Anywho, what I wanted to talk about tonight, we burned through 29 minutes, was uh, a rather uh, intricate issue, and it's, diversified livestock on the homestead right so here's where i started out uh we had what was our first animal was chickens and the second animal was the goats and pigs and then i wound up with steers and at one point with pigs i actually bought out a uh a farrowing house that had burned down and there was still equipment there that I could use. And I set it up in a shed that was off the back of my barn, kind of a lean, lean to, and we had a six position farrowing outfit where I could walk the sows in. They would 
get up in the farrowing crate. There was a, you know, a heat mat on them and it was on this expanded steel that's covered with, um, with rubber. It's called tender foot and the manure would drop down through and, uh, then you'd have to rake it out and put it, rake it out. And then the, the farrow, the, the pig would farrow and, uh, the babies would be under heat lamps and all this stuff. And, you know, it was like, uh, agricultural or factory agricultural wannabe type thing. It didn't make a lot of sense, but I was new and that's the way they had done it at the plant that I bought out, which was a friend of my, my a friend of my wife's husband's mom owned the place before it burnt. So, um, that's where we started out and we never looked at the animals that we had as a system. We never looked at them like working together. Like we, okay, you got chickens and you got pigs. They're separate. There's no commonality. They, they don't, uh, complement each other in any way. We had them separated. Uh, as far as I knew, if the chickens ever jumped over the fence and got in with the pigs, the pigs would rip them up and eat them. So it didn't look like they went together at all. Uh, the calves that we would buy, we would put round bales off for them in the field in a round bale feeder and they would eat. And that was it. We didn't do anything that was where these animals were working together. And that took a while, right? Uh, and it, a lot of the, the interconnectedness between different species of animals came from them just interconnecting on their own. And then we'd observe it and say, well, I wonder if we, you know, if we facilitate this a little bit and then I would hear stuff and then I would read stuff that got my attention and then, Oh, you mean like in nature, you know, the farm could be like, nature like out in the woods here we have bears and deer and rabbits and you know otters and possums and skunks and all that stuff and they all kind of share a space and they pretty well stay out of each other's way um but uh if the coyotes didn't have the mice and the voles well then they would have to eat chickens and and rabbits from me, but they don't because they have mice and voles and all that stuff. So those guys, they seem to get along right there. Um, the bears, they really like it when the bees make, you know, nests in trees, in hollow trees, and the honey drips down out of there. Because the bears go there and they'll pull all that stuff out. And then the bees rebuild it a little higher next time. Doesn't matter. They still get it. And so they all kind of work together. Um, if a deer dies out in the woods, I've actually seen this where poor deer is dead from whatever. Maybe got hit by a car or worse. And uh, there'll be possums all over it eating all the meat off of it and then you know so they they do work together uh, so when we get on the farm we have to figure out a way all the different species that we could possibly have how can they complement each other because every species is going to have uh, if you write it all down you're going to have assets and liabilities on every species like chickens okay assets eggs liabilities manure right so how can you take the eggs how, well how can you take that manure and switch it over here to the asset column how can you do that so that's that's the question um now i can think of one thing we could do is with that manure, if we can accumulate that manure, we can mix it with something carbon-based and we can compost it 
and then it can go into a growing area where we grow things for one of the other species. We could even be growing stuff for the chickens to eat. So we could be growing turnips and then bring those turnips in, throw them in with the chickens and the chickens eat them again. Or we can save them someplace. They'll freeze solid, throw them in there in the wintertime. They'll still eat them. And it's got that sweetness in it and a little bit of nutrition for them. Yeah, they're not going to lay eggs real good on it, but they don't lay eggs real good in the wintertime anyway. Um, let's see. What could be another example of how these animals can work together? Um, I don't do this, but here's a good example. A lot of guys will will do this if they have the time to do it, it seems like. I, I, I just don't have the time to do it. But what they will do is they will graze cattle and behind the cattle about four days, they will run a specially made uh, hen house, usually on a hay wagon frame. And they will pull it out there about four days behind the cattle. And what happens in four days is the, the manure flops uh, have flies that land on them, lay their eggs, and the eggs start to get to the point where they're just like a, a white little cute little worm, you know, sort of like a little cute little maggot, you know. And... The chickens will come down in the morning and they'll go out and they'll be rooting around and, oh, look what we got here. Look at some cute little maggots. And, hey, protein's protein, right? So they'll just, they'll start eating those maggots. And when they do that, then they, they push the manure everywhere, you know. So you have the chickens and the cows kind of working together. The Although the... You know, the manure coming out the back of the cows is not exactly a liability. It becomes definitely an asset when it becomes the uh, the medium for maggot production, right? But there's other ways to produce maggots, that's for sure. If you come here, you'll see that I have a, a post in the chickens area, and there's a, a pulley up on top of it, and I run a bucket up there. I can pull the bucket down and I can put stuff in it that the flies will really like. And the little bucket has a whole bunch of holes drilled into it. And whenever, you know, the maggots start kind of boiling over, they, they fall out onto the ground and the chickens just, uh, they eat them. So it's kind of a fun thing. So in that case, you have flies that, what are flies good for? Well, they produce maggots. What are maggots good for? Well, the chickens like them, and the chickens need the protein. So they do work together. Uh, Justin's saying, Joel Salatin's bunny barn with chickens on the floor is a cool example. Sure is. Uh, when you raise rabbits the way we do it, we have uh, the small square wire on the bottom. And that's like that so that the smaller rabbits don't fall through it, right? Because sometimes the, the wire can be about that big, the wire opening. And on the floor, it's about that big. But a rabbit doot, that's the scientific name for a turd, a rabbit turd. It's a doot. It will fall through there. Bunny doots, they call them. Uh, I've seen it in books, right? They'll fall through there and fall onto the ground. And what the Salatins do is they'll have those things off of the ground, you know, like three feet up. You don't want them too close because then the chickens will see like a brand new pink bunny and they'll start pecking them from underneath. So you don't want that. You don't want them too close. You want them up about three feet. And when those little bunny dudes fall down there, they'll scatter them out. So they're constantly scattering, them, which I, I guess is productive. I don't know if they all fall down in a pile and you could scoop them up and it would, but, but I, I tell you what would happen is if there were ever any insects, 
that started to propagate in that manure on the floor, uh, the chickens would definitely go through and they would be getting all that larvae. And so, yeah, that would work. What else do we have? Um, uh, the tried and tested and true example, uh, we have a chicken processing business on our farm. So we process other people's poultry on Fridays. And one of the liabilities from that is like heads, guts, feet, and feathers, right? So what do you do with that? Uh, you can bury it, I guess, but that doesn't do anybody any good. Nobody that we would, that we can think of would do any good from that. I suppose the worms and stuff would eat it. Uh, you can compost it for sure, but the problem with composting it is you have to keep any predators away from it. And if, if you've got, say, a third of a yard of chicken guts and you dump it into a compost pile and then you cover it, and let's say it's a nice hot pile and it starts to get going, it makes a lot of heat, and then your favorite little puppy dog goes out there and starts digging in it and says, Ooh, look what I found. <laughs> and they start eating some, you know, Oh, look at this head, this chicken head. It's only four days old. It sure is tasty. I like it so much. I think I'm going to roll around in it. <laughs> and the stupid dog comes and sees you sitting down, enjoying a nice iced tea. You're sitting there relaxing and stuff. And the dog comes over, puts its head on your lap. And then you start petting the dog. And then all of a sudden, the stink hits you. And then you realize, ah, I got it all over me. The dog just slimed me. And that's reality. That happens. So it's not a good choice to put those guts into a, into a pile like that. It's too much, really. It would take too long. I mean, it would work, but you'd have to have a gate up around it keep any animals from getting in there so a better way is if you have pigs i mean they need protein and fresh chicken fine guts hey it, you know the pigs they're like hey look what's in this this is like uh i don't know if, you, if they were talking amongst themselves it's like hey this is like ritz crackers here so that's a source of protein that you don't have to buy for your for your pigs and uh then you don't have to pay to have somebody take it away either right you don't have to have it hauled off so those two things fit together they both benefit each other and you as the farm you make more of a gain because let's say you just fed your pigs uh, 400 pounds of guts. Well, the pigs are going to, a certain amount of that is going to be gain on their overall weight. And that's the reason why you're feeding the pigs is to get them big. So then you can process them. Okay. Then the question is, okay, I processed three pigs yesterday and pretty cold outside so i would take the gut pile take the stuff out of it that we want we wanted the spleen we wanted the kidneys we wanted the heart we wanted the liver and everything else i just put it in a neat little pile right on the snow overnight froze solid so then it didn't happen today but it'll happen tomorrow i will pick that up and i'll take it over to the chickens and drop it in and they will eat those guts and it's legit i mean it's good fresh it's frozen but it's good fresh pig guts is it okay to feed pig guts to chickens yeah is it okay to feed chicken guts to pigs yeah it's sort of like feeding well i won't go there but it you know they both need protein uh, is feeding chicken to chicken good? 
Mm, no, I don't think so. Feeding pigs to pigs, I know that's not good, right? And feeding cows to cows, that's, I think that's against the law. I don't think you can do that because of mad cow disease. Drink a Canada Dry tonight, ginger ale. Really like it. I don't like pop that much, but that's good. I've been, I've been uh, drinking that since I was a kid. So, um, whenever you're going to add another species to your farm operation, you should be thinking about it, or I would be thinking about it now at the stage that I'm at. Like, how am I going to fit this in? You know, obviously, let's say I added, uh, let's say sheep right now. Um, I'd have to think, well, how does that, how does that benefit the overall operation? All right. Um, or let's say goats, let's say I was going to add goats there might be a situation where I could say, oh yeah, I see how that could work. So there's parts of this farm that are really thick, uh, very wet, and uh, what we would call very good browse, right? Uh, browse is bushes that are, you know, that, a, that a, a goat can go to and eat the leaves off and maybe even eat the tips of whatever it is that grows there. They like to do that. Uh, deer do that too. Of course, they'll always eat grass too. But if there was a place that I needed to get browsed back, and so goats could work in that, in that capacity, and you could keep them in there for a while, uh, let them get, you know, grown up on that browse, and then slaughter them for meat. So that might work. I don't know. A lot of people get into goats and find that they're not as profitable. I know one place that seems to be doing pretty good with them. They milk them, you know, and uh, they seem to be doing pretty good with them. So there you go. I uh, I I think about I think about things differently now when I'm going to put uh, an animal on. Like when we put rabbits back on, hadn't done that in years. But then we decided that, hey, this would really work because the feed for this animal is everywhere on this farm. We, we don't have to purchase any of this. All we have to do is harvest it, give it to the, the rabbits, and then they will give us young rabbits that we can give more of that same material to and at the end of it we can process them and we can have a freezer that has got 50 rabbits in it and so instead of having chicken all the time we can have rabbit once in a while and rabbit is really good meat it's really uh really good meat um so they they do fit in because of the way this farm is. If I was someplace that did not have as much forage crops as I do have, um, it might not work out so good. So forage crops for me, for rabbits, um, are something like a lamb's quarter that here all you have to do is you could kick a hole in the sod and lamb's quarter would shoot right up there in a couple of days. And if you leave that stuff grow to grow unchecked, it'll have a stalk on it about like this at the bottom. And you can pull branches off of that thing all day long and just, you know, the tender branches and just put those in with the rabbits and they will just love you and they will just chow that stuff down. And it's, it's really good stuff. Eat some yourself and see how good it is. It, uh, it really makes you feel good when you eat it because it's got a lot of nutrient in it that's really necessary for the human uh, human survival. Are you kidding me? 8.49? Wow. Time really flies. 
Andy's saying my goats are brush clearing machines. Where the heck are my glasses? There they are. Caitlin Hacker. That was Lamb's Quarter. Lamb's Quarter is like a mainstay. It's it's people call it a weed, but it's it's a real nice plant. Hildy's with us, right on. My dad's my dad raised two hundred rabbits for us for food. Ballistic Mystic, dogs love the deer guts, and they roll and come back all proud and happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, we processed a few deer around here this year, and we will always take the rib cage and throw it in with the chickens, and they will totally clean it off. Every piece of meat is gone. So chickens are, you know, they're omnivore. So you can always count on them to clean up any meat that you have laying around. Uh, yeah, Andy, rabbit guts, rabbit guts, uh, pigs don't like them. Like, well, the way we skin them out, I don't know if you figured this out, but we just go right from the back. And if it's, a an older rabbit, that's got a tough hide on it, you can't do it, but you can make a little cut and you just go like this and you tear the hide. And one side will pull right over the head, and then we cut the head off so it has the head in it. And the other side pulls right off the back end, and we'll cut the feet off and leave them right in the hide. And it's it's actually pretty quick to do it. But when we try to give those guts to the to the pigs, they don't they don't like them. All right. Resistance chicks say, I feel like I want to steal that for any poo. Doot. It only really works for bunnies, though. Bunny doots. AJ says, I'm a legend. I wonder which AJ that is. AJ, is that Adam Joint? I haven't seen you in a few years, bro. Thomas Massey, he is a and he's a farmer. Yes, he is. I'll call his office tomorrow. He was telling me that uh, if there's a hot topic, if they get ten calls at their office, that's a lot. People don't get involved. All right. Ooh, if you could get Charles on a Zoom call, that would be great. He's got a very interesting story to tell. If you uh, look at his, uh, uh, the website for his, for his campaign, he's got a lot of pictures of himself in there. And real interesting. If you look in the background and just see how he's dressed and, you know, what he, he's doing. Um, a lot of times Green Beret, they're very different. They're, you know, you, you hear Green Beret and you're thinking like absolute killers. Not really. They're hearts and minds people. They're uh, train the trainer type people. They're... Um, they're I've, very compassionate people, you know, they're killers too, but I 
All right, so that's that's what I got for species on the farm. And you know, we when we talk species of animals, then the next jump would be species of of plants as well. And uh, then we get into the whole argument of weed versus non-weed. And weed is not actually a word that I can kind of really like because the things that we classify as non-weeds, that's just because we call it that. Like with a lamb squatter, if you go out and harvest that and have lamb squatter uh, soup and lamb squatter salads and you know, um, all kinds of things. You can prepare it like you prepare um, spinach or all kinds of stuff. Uh, then is it is it a weed? You know, well, what really is a weed? It's, it's just a word that needs to be thought of in a different light. There's very little in our, our environment that we can't harvest to feed to somebody. Very little. It's, uh, it's surprising. And a lot of the things that I don't really, you know, it's it's a weed, let's say like Doc, I pull it off and I eat one. Uh, I don't really like that that much. But if I give it to the rabbits, they like it. And I like eating rabbits. So I don't want to eat it, but they do. And then I can eat them. So we really do live in Eden. We really do. There's just food everywhere. We just have to know how to manage it. And we just have to have a point of reference that's a little bit different. So I think I'm going to call it quits there. Tomorrow night's going to be our open line Friday. And I'd like to solicit your guys' uh, your guys's, uh, questions and also subjects that you'd like to talk about and uh, we can go from there i had a good full day today i'm feeling ready to uh, go on to the next thing which would be something to eat and then i'm looking for a new uh i like these 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 documentaries like i just watched this one grandchester i don't know if i like that too much but it was okay and uh did you see the kibble's question no aj just put it in there it's in caps a little bit okay we got a question stand by yeah not to interrupt you people all right but uh i'm looking for a new thing to watch on tv well not tv it's uh amazon you know so you can watch different documentaries and stuff really good Ballistic says, Lamb's Quarter is the number one volunteer when I till my garden. Just think, if you harvested that and you figured out a way to lay it out on sheets or whatever, um, like sheets of old roofing material in the sun and dry it, um, because that's basically what I'm doing when I make hay. I'm cutting the grass crushing the stalks, drying it down a little bit, and then rolling it up, making bales out of it. Um, a lot of times I'll find lamb's quarter in there, and it's perfectly preserved, you know, as part of the hay. Trader Joe says lamb's quarter is quite easy to kill. You bet, resistance checks. Chicks. Do you feed your dogs kibble? I'm interested in LGD, but I'm worried I don't have enough proper nutrition. Um, we do. Um, primarily, though, you know, with the butcher shop, they're getting uh, stuff from the shop. So, um, but. This kibble right here, there's a trash can full of it, and Jill will usually buy that when, um, in the wintertime, when we're not doing a lot of butchering. 
So, but like the pigs that I butchered yesterday, like I said, we took out what we wanted of the guts and they laid the gut pile in the snow. And Obi went through and took what he wanted and we'll hide it. You know, I'll find different places where they, they bury stuff. They bury stuff in the barn. They bury stuff in between bales. Um, they hide it. They just, they eat what they can and then they hide the rest. But we don't buy it all the time and it's not primarily what they get. If that answers the question. They do eat a lot. But if you're going to raise livestock, I really don't know how else you can do it. You know, it's just such a a hassle trying to keep predators away from your livestock. It really is a hassle. But when you have a dog, uh, a guardian dog, your problems kind of come to a screeching halt. You know, they just they just keep everything back. You know, and my dogs right now, they are not staying out at night. Obi's old now. So uh, he was going through a thing there for a while where we thought he was in his last days. He was so stiff getting up and then took him to the vet. The vet said, oh, he's really low on this. I don't remember what it was, but she said, he's so low on it, I'm surprised he's alive. So now they got an additive they put it in his food and he's his old self again so we'll you know he'll be around for a few more years good nice dog real nice dog i hate to lose him i have pulled up the lamb's quarter to add it to the compost you bet Tons of free food, just like you would spinach. Plus, we make, oh, yeah, that's right. Rachel makes pesto. Rachel and Jill, they make pesto out of lamb's quarter. So they're going out and they're harvesting them when they're about two feet tall. So they're still pretty supple. And then strip them off. And those leaves... They put those in a blender, I think. Yeah, a blender with oil and garlic and I think some salt. And then, and it just makes this pesto, like a paste. And then they put it in, in jars. And when it sits in there for a little while, it gets even better. But we, I eat it all the time. Take spoonfuls of it out, put it on your plate, and then mix it in with other stuff. Really good stuff. Virgil's saying, put the lamb's quarter in salad. Right on. Oh, Keith's heading to bed. See you, buddy. Huh. Trader Joe saying, never thought about it. Well, now you should. Because it's free. You could probably live on it. I eat it all the time. Whenever I see it. I eat all kinds of stuff uh, that grows here. One of my other favorite things is those kind of red flowers that grow on um, clover, red clover. It's a ball about that big. And a friend of mine's mother was here one time, and she said, oh, whenever you see these, you should eat them because it'll keep you from getting sick. So I ate a couple of them, and they're just, you know, they're kind of sweet, but they got a good flavor to them. Every time I see them, I eat them, and I think about her. Hmm. All right, you guys, I'm going to get going. I appreciate everybody coming by. Um... Oh, I can't believe I forgot this. I cannot believe I almost forgot to say this. Have you heard that the EU has dropped all COVID res restrictions, everything? They've dropped it all, the masks, the 
Wu flu shots, everything, all gone in the in European Union. So, uh, and I get you, you probably haven't caught that if you're watching CNN and NBC, but uh, it's true. I actually saw the article. It was in on BBC and AP. So that's it. It's over. It's just all about waiting for it to come here. No. Yep. It was just a good one, and you were talking about it. That's a good story. Trader Joe. He's. Not yet, huh? Yeah, well. Yeah, they did. I saw the articles. Okay. Caitlin, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, we, I got out in 2004 out of the service and 2005 is when I met Joel Salatin and, you know, the whole, um, pastured poultry thing. And we built our first couple of tractors and had them actually in the side yard here, there was no fences. So it was all yard, whole farm was yard. And, uh, that was my first experience with going out and finding 10 dead chickens. And it's like, they're dead, but they're still there. Whatever killed them, just killed them for fun. It seemed like, and I was really having a hard time with that. I wasn't used to it. And, uh, then there was a, a conference in 2007 and I went to it and I said, it, it wasn't Joel, it was his son. And I went up to talk to him after and I said, what do you guys do about predators? And he said, you need a dog. And I said, didn't say that in the book. And he said, it should have, <laughs> something like that. Maybe I missed it or something, I don't know. But he rattled off a couple of dogs that are pretty good. And one was Great Pyrenees. And I came home and we were like not going to do pasture poultry anymore because it was just too brutal, the amount of losses that we were having. And just the morale around here was not good. The way it would go would be you would patrol it really heavy at night and you'd think, okay, I got a handle on it now. And then a week would go by and you go out and it's just slaughter, just slaughter. And to say, you know, it just wasn't good because it, it, it was too much in the air. It was, it was too risky to have all those chickens out in a, in a brooder or out in a chicken tractor, even though they were right outside, uh, you know, my, my windows right over here. And it was like maybe 30 yards from my window and I sleep, I hear stuff, you know, stuff wake up and I would miss it. And so it was, it was really bothersome. One night I went out, I heard them clucking and I went out and there was something on top of the tractor and it was an owl and it flew up on top of a telephone pole. And I thought, well, I'll just scare it away. And I shot and I hit it. And killed it and so i went and i got the owl and i disposed of it and what i thought was the owl was probably waiting for predators to come in and it was killing the predators but it was actually the owl that would go into the chicken tractor and kill a whole bunch of chickens needlessly and just leave them didn't even take anything out of them so owls were were pretty bad and uh possums were bad raccoons were bad uh foxes and we did a lot of shooting <laughs> but there's a lot of predators out there uh night hawks uh red-tailed hawks um eagles they're bad during the day can't shoot at them um but then we got the 
the Great Pyrenees, and it really came to a screeching halt. And now, occasionally, there'll be something. We usually leave a live trap out and put uh, one of those little cans of cat food in it. It's really smelly. And uh, uh, skunks will go in it. Uh, possums will go in it. And every year we'll usually catch something or the dogs wind up getting sprayed. Skunks now are kind of the major thing, but we don't lose a lot to them. So that's how we got started in them. And I really like them. And I don't think I would ever go to a different dog. I, I'm needing to get another male and I may be doing some, some swapping with, Another tribe member over a puppy. I need a new male puppy. All right. All right, man. I'm going to roll. Let's see if we got anything that I missed. Great Britain may have dropped the COVID regs or the PM did. No, I heard it. It was Boris Johnson. He's the prime minister of the European Union. Yeah, I, I caught an owl in a chicken tractor one time, and it got stuck in there. And then, you know, the sun came up, and everybody was out there, and the owl just kind of sat tight. And I didn't want to hurt him. And I threw a jacket over him, and I clutched him and brought him, and I put him in a, uh, a cage, and I, my plan was to take him someplace far away and let him go. And I have some friends that live about 60 miles from here. So I drove him up there and I let him go. And it was a female. Evidently, it came back. Yep. You really, I think you can shoot them if they're molesting your animals, but I hate to do it. You know, it's better to have the the guardian dog and the guardian dog uh, owls really don't want to get involved with that. And then you can get pretty smart about setting traps for them. Uh, setting a trap for an owl is actually pretty easy to do. So let's say you have your field with chicken tractors on it. If there isn't a, a pole out there, well, no, there wouldn't be. Um, get a pole, get a, like a round pole, like, uh, a cedar pole, cut it off flat at the top. Maybe if it's 10 feet, that would be about good. And then put a leg hold trap, a small one, leg hold trap about like this big up on the top of it and just put a screw in to hold it. And when an owl comes, they will light on the highest whatever the highest object they will stop there so they can eyeball everything before they're going to swoop down and take what they're going to take and they will light right on top of that they'll stop on top of that and snap the leg hold trap will get them hold trapped if you haven't done trapping they don't they don't crush bone they just close and like if it closed on your finger yeah, it would hurt, but it's not going to snap the bone because if it snaps the bone, then it goes numb and eventually the animal will just chew through it and get away. It's just got a, it's a leg hold trap and it will hold that owl's foot until you can get out there and you can take the pole down. Like we, we do it, we set the pole up against maybe a fence or screw a board to the bottom of it so it'll sit there like a Christmas tree. And um, and then you get the owl like that, and then you can put it in a cage, and you can take it far, far away and uh, let it go. Or we, we really don't – we haven't messed with them in years. We just haven't seen them. So when they decide that they can't live here, they go a little further and live – Boris Johnson is Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. 
which has nothing to do with the EU. Boris Yeltsin, which has nothing to do with the EU. All right, I'm going to get going. Thanks, you guys.